All right. Hello, everyone. Good morning or good afternoon. Tim Watson here with Meet the Masters with uh, Master Tim Butcher. Hello, sir. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. How are you? I'm doing well. Thanks for joining me. I really appreciate it. Yeah, I appreciate you inviting me. Thank you. How are uh, how are things where you are right now? Um, yeah, I mean, we're back on a, a sort of a national lockdown. We uh, we managed to come out of lockdown for a little while and get back in the uh, the dojangs training. And unfortunately, now we've been asked uh, back on Zoom again, training from from our living rooms. But, uh, you know, the commitment's fantastic from the students. And, uh, you know, we're, we're, we're keep keeping it going, keeping it real. It's nice. Yeah, you, obviously, I don't wish going back into lockdown on anyone, but at least now you're like, you, you kind of hit the ground running and you, you know what to do and, and what to... What yeah, to I think we've got, we've got all the processes in place now. Um, so it was a lot easier when it first happened, I think. I mean, myself, from word go, as soon as we went to lockdown, I was straight onto Zoom straight away and I, I was teaching straight away. But I think it's gave us actually um, a real insight of how a different way of teaching um, because sometimes you do try and get together and do some one-to-one -one sessions, <clears throat> which is always quite difficult to find a place to do it with. Um, and we didn't use Zoom before, so I think it's really opened up our eyes to another way of teaching, another way of training, uh, another way of communicating with your students and sort of, you know, helping them out. So I think, you know, I'm going to carry on using it, you know, once this pandemic is over, definitely carry on using it to teach students for one-to-one -one sessions and things like that. I think it's ideal. Um, yeah, I think that's a great idea. Um, and we we did the same things. Were you still streaming your classes when you were uh, in the Dojang, as far as Zoom goes? Or how, how were, you, were you doing? No, no, I just literally went straight back into the Dojang. Um, just got some live sessions going. Obviously, we had still had some strict rules to follow by, you know, the, <clears throat> the space between the students wearing masks to and from class. Um, taking temperatures and logging everybody's temperatures. We had a track and trace in the hall as well, which is something, I don't know where you have that in, in, in the US, but we have a track and trace. So if anybody gets COVID, it can get sure. tracked over you with and things. So um, yeah, um, we just put everything in place to keep everybody safe. And everybody just, and we, everybody just couldn't wait to get back and doing live training. Um, but you know, unfortunately, as from last week, we're back in again. Um, had a great session last night. They're the first one really since uh, lockdown. Um, had about 35 students sort of mm -hmm. for the first session. So it was great, you know. 35 students in my little living room here. So, <laughs> <laughs> but, yeah. Yeah, it's uh, funny how you have to figure out a makeshift dojang. Yeah. Um, <laughs> you see like, flag, flags in people's living rooms and. <laughs> Yeah, I'm mean, hanging on the curtain behind or draped over the sofa, you know. But it's, it is great. I think um, the fact that students are dedicated enough to say, like, I'm going to do this, I'm going to train from home, you know, and um, and we can give, a, you know, I find my, the tuition that I give online is is as good as in the, in the Dojang, really. You know, we, you, I put it onto the big screen as well so I can see everybody big. And um, I just really, I, I enjoy it. And it's a different type of training because you're doing everything on the spot. You know, you move around the spot and it gives you some different ideas which you perhaps wouldn't use in the dojang as well. So it's another way of training. So I, I think anything with martial arts, when you do something different, you're adding to your you're adding to your you know your abilities rather than sort of taking something away, you know. Absolutely. It definitely gave me some different things to work on. Um, yeah. whether it was one steps, making <clears throat> making people do one steps on both sides. Yeah, uh, you know direct multi-directional things when you can't do line drills in your living yeah. room for too long <laughs> yeah 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 no i always use like a, a clock where you got 12 6 3 and 9 and we attack at different arrows and things like that um that was that goes down well some are different some are different to think about um sure. and students enjoy it you know and we have little card games where you pick a card and each deck of cards got an exercise another one's got a number and we do the exercises so Good way to interact and stuff with the students rather than just sort of stand there and do your techniques, you know, try and make it fun for the young ones as well. Sure. That's a, that's a good idea. I'll have to bring that back out, the deck of cards. Um, yeah, yeah, no, it works. I think uh, it's interesting. Like I said, it's something different as well. So, How, how about your personal training? Has, has that changed with everything that's going on? You've been able to... Yeah, it's sort of, uh, because I'm, I'm a regional instructor here, um, my... My instructor's master can, and obviously he's sort of three hour drive away when we when we did train. So 
uh, my personal training would be really me training in the gym and going through and, you know, and, and teaching some of the masters within my region I teach, obviously. So by teaching, I'm, I'm more teaching than training these days. You know, we go sort of once a month with master can obviously online now, you know, it's a little bit easier. Again, there's another advantage. Now we're doing Zoom. I can train with master can uh, more often. Uh, I don't do it enough because of my work pattern. And he teaches the same nights I do. <laughs> so we're both teaching Zoom at the same time. Um, but obviously, you know, it gives you advantage. So you don't have to travel three hours to train with him. Uh, so personal training, I, I've just hit the gym, you know, enjoying working out in the gym and uh, keeping keeping fit. Just so keep that one step ahead of your students, really, because uh, they're younger, fitter, and uh, they're always chasing you. you know? Actually, I'm... I, I'm glad you said that. My my instructor, I did an interview last week and he said the same thing. He's like, I never ask my students to do anything I can't do. And, uh, you know, I'm the same way. I tried to do my best to set a good example for, for everyone coming through. And and uh, it sounds like you do the same thing. Yeah, well, it's all about it. That's all a master's about, isn't it? It's uh, set an example uh, to, to, to everybody and whatever we do, whether it's our teaching, you know, way of life, whatever we do, that's, I think that's what we do best. Um, and I think that's what, you know, it's been good for my leadership clinics and things like that. It's really gave us that insight to work with different people and, you know, different masters, get different ideas and stuff. But certainly it's the time as a master to give back, you know, um, and just help everybody else really. So I think, I think it's, uh, it's phenomenal what we can all do for everybody in that sense, you know. Absolutely. I got a bunch of people saying hello. Uh, Tom Lyons here from Region 8 says hello. Master Wiskin says hello. Uh, Marino says Tong Su from Greece. Uh, Ian Crook says hello, sir. Willie Richardson from Region 8. Becky Shepard. Lindsay. Uh, Karen Elise says your classes are well organized and safe. Um, uh, <laughs> yeah, Gary Jarvis says good afternoon. Pam Russell from Region 5 says hello. And uh, yeah, so it, if, if any of you have a, a, a question in particular, you want to ask Master Butcher, feel free to Put it in the comments here and i'll uh i'll be sure to get to it yeah so as far as getting started in the martial arts it seems like martial arts have been a big part of your life pretty much all of your life yeah could you tell us how how did you get started in the martial arts well it was, it was my uh, neighbor actually my neighbor started training tanks though and um i was friends with his daughter and then one day he said, you know, do you, want, do you want to come train? And I was seven years old. Um, and back then, my first instructor was uh, Master C.S. Kim from Mudok Kwong Tang Sudo. And his son was, sons were Tong Wong, Song Su. They were teaching in the UK. Um, and that's where, where I started. So we went up at seven years old. And to be honest, apart from a little break in between Mudok Kwong going back to America and the World Tang Sudo taking over in the UK, um, I had about a, a year off, I think, because I was young, a bit younger then. I've been training since I was seven, and um, you know, I've never looked back. It's I get up, I do tanks like I breathe. You know, you get up in the morning, and and that's is what I do. You know, and it's uh, you know, my first testing was I think it was 1981 in Bristol, and we had uh, Grandmaster Huanqi from Muda Kwan was there. Wow. Uh, actually, at my one, I think it was my first and my second testing. He was in the UK. So it's nice that I had chance back there. You know, I was younger. I can't really remember too much, but I could just remember being there. And what phenomenal instructor sort of master Kim was. I think you've seen pictures of him with sort of uh, chains and chains for his arms with buckets of water and things like that. And a hell of an endurance person. But um, yeah, no, it was, it was, I think when you come up against these sort of the Korean martial arts and what they were very basic to what we do now, but they had a certain, Thing about them it just it was like watching a movie when you watch them you know it's just I think as a kid you just were so inspired by them that uh, you just want to be like them I mean it's nothing like we do now where I think we got green belts so we do more advanced techniques now than they do. <laughs> you know? it was very much very basic but it was a very slow process you know that you're so that it was at Chung Sik Kim the, the yeah yeah yeah, yeah, so he's uh, he's here. Uh, I think he's based in Pittsburgh now. That's right. Yeah, yeah. But his, son, yeah, his son's he, there. With Tong Wong, his son, I think, is with him as well. Yeah. And he, I mean, he's still phenomenal. I still see him doing stuff on Facebook, and uh, yeah. yeah, he's he's yeah. he was a phenomenal martial artist. I think it was a real inspiration as a young lad. Um, 
to see someone like that. And like I said, the most advanced technique you see in class will probably be a jump front kick, jump round house kick. But then <clears throat> the two sons would do a sparring session at the end of a class. And then it was like watching a movie because they showed, they would do stuff that we'd never seen before. Uh, they wouldn't teach you in class. They taught you very, very basic things. They, they held a lot of stuff back years ago. Like these days, you know, we teach white belts pretty much as much as we can, depending on the individual. Um, but those days, you know, the most advanced kick at Dangre was a jump front kick, jump around those kick. You know, it was very, very, but we were good at what we did. It was very basic, you know. But, so um, did they, um, did your, did your instructor just leave? And so you were left without yeah. place to train? Yeah, well, my, uh, my next door neighbor who took, used to take me training, he had a bit of a family, I think a family issue at the time. And, um, uh, yeah, so I just stopped going for a very short period of time. And it was just at the time when uh, Master Kim went to the US. Uh, and when I came back, uh, Master David Perks, or he was uh, part of World Tank Steel Association when I was back in the US. So I went out there expecting to see the career masters and things like that. And uh, Master Perks, who was in the class with me back in the, back in the day, was now teaching. And so I, I went back in. I remember having, I got a picture here, actually. This was my, uh, when I was... I think 10 or nine with my white belt, yellow tag. You know, we had to grade for your first tag back then, a yellow tag and a yellow belt. Uh, but I went with the same dobok on this. So it was sort of halfway up my legs. It was really short. And uh, <laughs> I just asked him if I could train. And then again, never looked back since. Awesome. When, uh, when did you first meet Master Khan? Well, I guess it was back then, you know, once he, uh, in the testings, when you come down for our gut testings and things like that, we, we met Master Khan then. Um, and I think when, when you were younger, it was like, you know, these days we're much, every, all the instructors are much more approachable. I think as a kid, you were sort of always afraid, you know, this is Master Khan, we can't talk to him. And, uh, you know, like some students are even with me these days, some of the kids, oh, you know, they're, they're afraid to talk to you. So I think back in the day, you know, you stood up, but you just looked to this uh, amazing martial artist uh, and, and were just inspired to be to kick like him, to, to do what he does. So, you know, he's always been a very traditional martial artist and that's such a fantastic technician. I think that for me is what, one of the things that kept me within martial arts, someone to aspire to and look at it and think, yeah, I want to kick like that. I want to I want to be like that, you know? And uh, that was a real thing for me. You know, Master Khan has been a massive inspiration in certainly my world tanks of though career, you know? And lots of friends, uh, unfortunately, have left World Tanks though now. They've got their own style in the UK. Um, occasionally I stay in touch with them. Um, and they were, they were all great friends and there were some great martial artists there as well. Um, so we had a great friendship back then, like we do now. Um, but, you know, things move on. They, they've gone off, done their own association. Um, but Master Khan was just the, the, the inspiration for me in World Tanks though, and still is, you know. Right. You look at him now, you still want to, you still want to kick like him, you know, <laughs> you know, I'm still trying. So absolutely. Yeah. Uh, speaking of uh, Master Khan, he just texted me. He said, uh, Tang, Moon, Tang Moon Kim is in, he's in Georgia now. Oh, well, okay. Um, there you go. There you go. That's my, uh, <laughs> he's dial, dial a friend. Uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So you mentioned earlier when we were talking, uh, offline about seeing Master Khan, uh, compete at world championships. Yeah. So you, you went, were you there or? Yeah. Yeah. My first world championship was in 88 in Philadelphia. Uh, I think I was 16, uh, brown belt. I think I was back then. And, um, yeah, I mean, it's phenomenal. The first time I seen Philadelphia, uh, the Philadelphia itself. I mean, as a kid, I was a massive Rocky fan. So to go to go to Philadelphia and go up the steps and see the Rocky statue, you know that that I think as a kid I was almost looking more forward to seeing that. <laughs> uh, but you know, seeing I was going to Philadelphia, I was just lucky to go. Um, I wasn't necessarily from a very affluent family, so those sort of expensive things were didn't come very often. But my mum and my dad really supported me when I got to the age of sixteen and said you can go on your own or with the team. Um, and yeah, that's my first world championship in Philadelphia. Uh, 1988, 1990, I think that was Philadelphia too. And one of those years, I think it was 88 when Master Khan was still competing. And uh, phenomenal. I remember, I think it was Lewis Marvel, Lewis Marvel in the final. I remember having Master Khan used to have these yellow pads, yellow fighting mat pads. And, uh, you know, I can remember watching thinking, God, 
you know, if he hit someone with some of those kicks he was doing, you know, he'd take the head off. But he, you know, he was always had great control, but he, he was just a natural, natural fighter. And I love fighting. So that's my forte, really. I think what I teach and things like that. And uh, again, inspirational to watch him back then and sort of his timing and things, what he did. did. And like me, he wasn't, we're not very tall. But um, I think Lewis Marvel was very tall and, uh, yes. you know, they would handle the, you know, handled very well. Um, so, yeah, again, another another time he inspired me to watch him spar really in the World Championship. That's excellent. Going forward, when was, uh, so you did 88, you said you, were, you went to 90 as well. Uh, yeah, 90, yeah. How many, how many times have you had the opportunity to come over for Worlds? I think it's um, four. Um, Certainly in the last uh, sort of few years, I haven't been able to, just family commitments and things like that. Sure. Um, you know, so 96 was my last time I competed because uh, that's when I, after I then went to as a master candidate. Um, but I thought that was in Las Vegas, 96. Um, got, you know, I, I, luckily I, I sort of got world champion back then, got my first place in reforms and first place in, in weapons. And then uh, I can remember my, my kind of fight. I was in the semi-finals to get in the final. And the other guy in the final was uh, another teammate of ours. So it was going to be an all-Brit final. And I was 2-1 down. Time was ticking away. And next, I literally felt someone come in the ring with me and tell me to chase. I turned around, there's Master Khan stepped in the ring and said, you've got to chase him. Got to chase him to get this point. And he literally had just come right at the side of the ring when he seen me. Because you see, I was hanging back because so I was a counterfighter. <clears throat> so you really need to get this point, you know. Um, the guy was a great fighter, and uh, unfortunately, I got a third place because he beat me. And then actually, he went on to beat up my teammate as well, um, who was a phenomenal fighter, Master Allen. Uh, me and him used to fight together. Uh, that's not Mike Allen, that's Mark Allen. I don't know whether you ever knew him years ago. Again, another phenomenal fight. We were in the finals every every time we fought. But uh, yeah, it's another time. Master Allen literally was just on my shoulder saying, you've got to chase, you've got to chase this point, you know. And next in the buzzer went. So unfortunately, I got two goals in the bronze back then. But, you know, I was managed to retire from competing sort of at the top of, you know, being a world champion and things like that, which uh, I can always say, you know, I retired. When I finished competing, I was, I was world champion. So it was uh, a thing for me because I love my competing. So reached my pinnacle where I could get to. Love to have got grand champion, but there you go. Never happened. <laughs> That's okay. You're you you know you were you were in there trying and yeah, it, it, it's not a bad thing to say. Oh, I only got two first and a th and a third. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, it's funny you, you you mentioned this story with Master Khan in your ear. I I had one with Master uh, Master Godwin one time where I got done a match. I won three to three to nothing, yeah, and yeah. Uh, he comes in my ear. He goes, "I don't know what you're doing out there, but you need to stop messing around and you need to get in there and win." And then it was my next match was against one of my teammates. And he was like, why did you get a talk? And I, and I didn't. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, yeah, it's... Uh, well, that shows us as instructors how much, um, how much commitment we put into our students, no matter what level they are. Right. Uh, we're always there for them. And, you know, my instructor was there for me, you know, even at the time of competing and things like that. So uh, we do it for our students. And I think that just passes down the line, doesn't it? You know, if we're treated that way, you know, again, leading by example, you know, we follow on down, don't we? Absolutely. I feel like I get more excited now to see my, my students uh, be successful in competition yeah. than I did when I competed myself. Yeah, yeah. You know, there's a, there was a period of time I think I went through a little bit of a kind of jealousy period. I still do now when I see them spar. I'd love to be in there. We have a little joke. But um, you look at the standard of competitors now, say it, it, when I, it, in my late 20s when I was at my peak, I don't know how I would have fared against them because you watch them now and you think, well, was I ever that quick? Could I have ever competed against these guys? They look phenomenal now when you watch these young Sam Dans mm -hmm. fighting and you think, could I have ever done it? I don't know. Um, but, you know, who knows? Who knows you know, uh, uh, maybe I could, maybe I couldn't, but I had my time, you know. We all sure. have our time away. People ask me what's different about training right now and I tell them that half of the stuff that I love to do is, is gone. So like sparring, we're not doing any sparring and I'm, I'm the same way. I'm, uh, sparring is my favorite thing. I love everything obviously, but, yeah. uh, yeah, sparring and, and actually making contact and hitting someone is definitely, 
uh, yeah. something I'm pining for right now. <laughs> yeah, and I always say to my students, I can't wait for the pandemic just so I can hit them. And that sounds really wrong. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. <laughs> so we can get in that little dust up, you know, and uh, but it's even even when we do the, you know, we do the applications within the young, you know, and just being able to grab all of and show how the technique works and things like mm -hmm. that. It's really frustrating that we can't do that right now. Um, so we, we're kind of teaching a pattern of moves and we can't really explain it fully. Not without sort of break, we can't break it down and have someone as a partner and things like that. But, uh, you know, it won't be long. I'll come back, I'm sure. Yeah, I've talked a lot about philosophy and, 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 breaking down stuff. And I, like you said, I can't wait to be like, all right, remember when we talked about this? Now we're going to actually, hurt, you know, throw it on someone and yeah, <laughs> make yeah. them feel the pain. Yeah. Um, so. Again, so I think we've all felt the pain in our time from our instructors. And again, another thing we pass down quite willingly to, uh, to our students too. Because if you don't, if you've never felt something, you can't apply it, can you, you know? That's right. <clears throat> so you talked about going to the world championships at 16. When did you start getting the bug or, or how, how did you get started training or uh, teaching? Teaching, I suppose, it became a natural thing because um, <clears throat> when I was 17, uh, I got my, my, my uh, sort of first down. And back in that day, I think my instructors turned around and said, you know, go and get a club, you know, open up a club. It was just an automatic thing back then. It's a little bit different. Nowadays, we do sort of training programs to make us better instructors and things like that. This was you've got your black belt, go and get a club. Mm -hmm. And um, like in the UK, we don't have full time studios. Uh, we go and hire a hall somewhere and we teach on a regular basis. Um, and then I used to train with um, uh, an instructor called uh, her name Elaine Evans, master. Uh, you know, she's not part of our association anymore. <clears throat> but she, um, I used to train over with her, and then she was le she was leaving or changing that club, so I just took over her her hall and took over a student's teaching. I've been training there for, since, as a young lad. And uh, yeah, I just took over when I was 17. I was teaching guys in their 20s and 30s, and I was a young lad at the front. And it was just something, you know, you've got your black belt, go and do it. And uh, I love, love, one thing I love is teaching. You know, now I just, I get such a buzz from teaching. And uh, it's more, probably even more than training these days. Training is just training. I, I, I enjoy it. I love keeping fit, but to give back and to train and to teach, I just, I, I, there's no better, greater buzz for me, you know, and, I, and that's what I love doing. And, you know, I love, I'll give my time to anybody, you know, just because I, I, I actually love teaching because, you know, you've got a lot of knowledge in my head somewhere and I just like to pass it on, you know, so. Um. I'm just looking at Master Khan messaged me. He said, Master Butcher is always a great example as a student. Only student I ever tested at and double graded as a red belt. It was yeah. very rare for anyone to double grade at that level. Yeah, it was quite phenomenal. Yeah, I was. Uh, so that did, going from second up to Chodonbo or? Yeah, second up to Chodonbo, yeah. Um, and yeah, I all said that. I think I was the only one to do it in the UK. Uh, or I don't know whether it's the association, but <clears throat> I was the only one to do it back then. And um, I didn't know what that meant back then. I was right. happy it happened, and uh, but I can remember the breaking, the breaking technique we did uh, at the end of the testing, and someone held a, a thermalite block on their hand like that, and we had to do a sort of 360 spin and back hook kick, and 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 break it. But it was a speed break for a, a three inch thermalite block. Wow. Uh, I can remember just being on form and kicking through that and leaving half the block on his hand while I took the other half off. And uh, knowing that again, I was I was a young lad. I was at my peak, and uh, yeah, phenomenal. But again, you know, it's, it's, it's the instruction you had back then. To um, my instructor would push me and push me to be the best I could, and we do the same now, don't we? So, I guess I was lucky, lucky to get a double grading. But um, really, really, uh, well, that's you know. pretty. I mean, considering you were probably early teens at that point, right? Yeah. yeah a brick, a speed wheel kick or a speed hook kick, or, you know, it was just someone holding on the palm of the hand. That's pretty impressive. <laughs> yeah, I, I, and that kind of inspired me to carry on doing these kind of breaking techniques uh, over the years. I used to love breaking. Um, I think it just impresses anybody at little demonstrations and things like that, doing your breaking techniques and things, you know? Sure. What, uh, what were some of the, the your signature breaks or things that you like to, to do breaks on? 
well, a lot of it was uh, a lot was spinning sort of speed breaks and things. But uh, I think one thing which is always it's easier than it looks. But I used to lie between two chairs with my feet on one end, head on the other, pile up sort of five blocks on my chest and let them break him over with a sledgehammer and things like that. That was good for demonstrations. So I like the endurance kind of breaking as much as the fancy spinning kicks and things. We used to put tiles, we used to pop a roof in tiles and people would hold it on their heads and we'd do jump spinning back kicks and take it off their head and things like that. But you had to have a lot of trust <laughs> that yeah. I wasn't going to kick you. you know? so, um, but always pushing, pushing those really flying side kicks over as many people as you could to go through a block at the end and, and things. Um, yeah, and again, just always pushing. And I guess another another part of training. I don't think we do so. I don't know about in the US, but we don't do so much of it for us now. Yeah, I mean, uh, actually, it's one of the things that I've done a lot uh, is is use shields, like the the air shields. Yeah, yeah. Uh, especially right now, since we, you know, not holding them, I'll I'll put them out for the kids and have them do that, do flying side kicks or jumps over them like that. Sure, yeah. um, you know, because. That's like, like you said, I, I think sometimes one of the advantages of starting at such a young age was you just did that stuff, right? Yeah. <laughs> you just did it because it was fun and then you got used to it. Whereas sometimes if you start as an adult, um, like we did break falls and rolls last night with the adult class and you know, right. someone yeah. starts when they're 40, it's like, oh, I gotta do a break fall. But <laughs> you know, you're probably doing dive rolls and things like that. Uh, from a young age, it just seems normal to you. <laughs> yeah, definitely. Yeah, and like I said, you try and get someone a little older trying to do it now. It's uh, it's quite quite a task for them, isn't it? You know, doing yeah. that. You know? But um, uh, got, still got a lot of people saying hello. Let's just run through these real quick. Stephanie Jaglin says, "Great teacher and leader for both children and adults." Oh, nice. Neil Will Neil uh, Willis says, "Good afternoon." Ian Crook says, "I, I really miss being a test subject." <laughs> uh, <laughs> to which Gary Jarvis chimed in. He says, no, you don't. I always see your hand up. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Oh, wow. Uh, Paul Warren says, hello, from a proud and grateful student. Master D says, uh, you were always an inspiration as our days of training were no pain, no gain training and sparring, the good old days. <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah, I can. Uh, me and Master D had some, we did some of our master's training together. Um, and it was really nice. Again, another, she's a very inspirational woman. Um, and, uh, you know, we supported each other a lot back then. And we, you know, we would, uh, as, as you do when you're in these master's clinics and things. I can remember doing, uh, I think I was instructing on one of her testings. Um, I think it was Master D. I believe it was, um, I'm trying to think who else was in the testing now. I can't think of, I know Master D, but there was only about four in the testing. And uh, Grandmaster Shin was actually on the panel. And I'm I was the instructor, but then Master Grandmaster Shin was giving me the techniques in Korean, and um, you know I felt I was testing that day. <laughs> you know, you you know you had those instructor, you Grandmaster Shin there giving you some techniques to to pass on to the students. I can remember again, it's a very proud time to be there because I think when you're instructor, especially when you have got someone like Master D who's testing or or other colleagues on friends on the floor you want to, you know, help them and encourage them the best you can if you've got chances. So when you're a conductor at the front, I think that's uh, a real privilege to do that and be able to sort of push them through their boundaries that you need to get through for these, these uh, master tests, you know? Absolutely. I, I look upon my training partners as like brothers and sisters now. And I, you know, you, it's kind of hard to imagine getting through something without them. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. I think back in the day with the master's clinics, uh, um, sort of in Alabama and places like when I first started doing master's clinics uh, in Alabama, I think that was when I really felt some sort of camaraderie from around the world and people come together and really, really push it. They were hard clinics back in those days. You know, they were, they were nearly, you know, they were a lot longer than the European clinics we do. And, um, and they pushed us to the limit all the time and, and you needed people in your ear trying to actually sort of push you through and, and you would push them through. And I think uh, those clinics back then really shaped me to to be maybe the instructor I'm now as well, because you really had to push uh, in those clinics, I think. And they were, 
they were a lot, I think they were a lot harder than uh, maybe some of the ones we do now. I mean, they're, the ones we do now are tough. I just think back in the day, I think things were a little different and we, uh, we certainly didn't get as many breaks as you do now. We, we didn't break, I don't think. We just kept going, you know, until late at night and things like that. I think my t- first testing went through the night into early hours. I think we started testing it at 10 p.m. And we carried on going to about one, two in the morning. And then I have to go back to your room with a written test. I think it was a real kind of break you down and rebuild your experience, you know? Sure. When you go through an experience like that, those people are, are like lifetime lifetime friends. Can yeah. you think of any of those people that were in that, that group with you that you uh, still keep in touch with? Yeah, obviously, but I, you know, obviously, but I obviously mentioned you know, sort of Master D and people like that I've done, I've trained with, uh, and got through Master Whiskin. We've done, we've done some training sessions. We had a great fifth down test, and he, I think he was doing his pre-test. I was doing my second testing. Um, we had a, a great session together. Again, it's a, a time where we pushed each other to our limits. Um, I think back in the day with Master uh, Master Brit uh, was one of our conductors, sort of in the the clinics back in Alabama. I can remember him being a very much inspirational speaker. He'd really kind of be able to push you and make you think in a different way and give you a very positive attitude to get through your testings. Um, and as I said, we always had, you know, Master Cam was always there. Master Cam was always the person to give you that kind of pat on the back and that kind of inspiration to push forward. But obviously he was quite often in the background because he was also very busy and you get conducted with you. But I always remember Master Brit and someone who really helped push me through back in the early days of the, the clinics. And, um, you know, he, w- he was a real, he used to come out with sort of the Martin Luther King speeches and, and, and really push you through with some kind of philosophies and things. Um, and obviously Master Wick, you know, uh, another amazing instructor, uh, God bless his soul, but he was a, he was a, he was a fantastic instructor. And he, he is another one that inspired me massively within those clinics. Um, you get to know all these people from around the world and, and um, get to train with them and learn with the, learn from them and, and teach them also. So I think, yeah, there's so many, you know, over the years, there's so many friends that I, I probably just could not never mention everybody, but, uh, you know, there's so many people you meet and inspire you over the years, and including students who are on my own now. You know, you look at them, what they go through and, what, and how they push themselves through. That inspires me as well these days, you know. Mm-hmm. Yeah, uh, Kiana Powell says Master Brit is the man. I it's funny when I went to Master's Clinic, the the year I went was the first year he had stepped away. But being in Region Eight, you know, if he's in the room, you, there's no question uh, yeah. that ever, all eyes are on him. And uh, yeah, he's 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 a great leader and just completely uh, amazing, amazing individual and so inspirational. Yeah, yeah definitely. He's, he's just give me some little things to think about, and it really did help. Really did push me through my early days. As I said, I think those clinic, cl- clinics were were brutal back in the day. You know, we start early, we finish late, we were train all day, um, and you needed to get through some kind of mental state to actually get you get through them. And uh, people like Master Brit really helped me back in the day. I believe. You know. We haven't talked much about him, but can you share some thoughts on on Grandmaster Shin when maybe when you first met him and and seeing him at those those clinics and world championships? Yeah, hundred percent. Um, I mean, Grandmaster Shin was again. I don't think I've ever met a humanitarian anything like him. Um, he had a persona about him that I, even as a young lad, I. Thought, I you know, obviously he was Grandmaster, so you know you don't, you don't get to see him that much. But when you did see him, I can remember being 16 again, 1988. We're in the World Championship. We were, I think, we were having a meal after the championship somewhere, a little party after party championship party. And I was 16. I can remember Grandmaster Shin walking out to me. There's a big bucket, a big bucket of ice with a few beers in, and he put his hand in this big bucket of ice and pulled me out a beer and gave me a beer, and said well done today and well you know and um this was me at 16 with grandmaster students that were giving me a beer and uh um i it's so again it's something that really stuck in my, my mind that um again he was grandmaster but he's very approachable he would always uh he would always speak to you and what always amazed me i think when i was doing my my thesis for my fourth dam 
I uh, I had to redo a few things because I submitted it and there was other things I had to put in and things. But when I spoke to Grandmaster Shin, he could recite what I wrote in my first Dan essay and what in my second Dan essay, my third. And he, I don't know how he could, have, you know, the amount of people we'd have to look through, but he, he could recite things that I wrote about and um, he would know things that, I can't remember what I did yesterday sometimes, but he, he had he had this ability to to do that. And, um, you know, it was just it really inspired me to think, well, I'm not just a number, you know, we're not just, we're not just a student from the UK. He really knew, he knew about me and he knew what was going, he knew my path, he'd really looked into it. Um, and I don't think there's many people that's got the ability to do that or, or, or you know, I know phenomenal martial artists, um, I can remember being at a clinic and we were all doing, you're talking about doing break falls and things and we were all doing rolls and falls and things. And Grandmaster Shin was up on the, on the balcony looking over. So you can see him looking, so everybody's trying extra hard to get it right and things like that. And all of a sudden, Grandmaster said, like, stop. And we all looked up at him and he came down and uh, he said, you're all like a bunch of elephants, he said. And all of a sudden, I don't know how old he was. So this clinic was back in 95, somewhere like, like that and he just dived over this pole into a forward roll and did that and it was just this silent as a cat it was just really silent and then turned around and said this is what we need this is how you do it and then just walked away and watched again and we all just sat there sort of with our mouths open thinking you know grandma should just come down from this balcony casually done this kind of break full roll that we were doing and left us with that inspiration to think well you know we can we got to do that as well as him. So that's a real special sort of moment thinking of things like that. Um, and obviously after we lost Grandmaster Shin, I think uh, Grandmaster Baldwin was probably the next closest thing we had to uh, Grandmaster Shin. As in a humanitarian, a great Grandmaster. And um, he was, again, someone who was able to remember your name, remember to talk to you and, and actually know you personally phenomenal person i think again he was great obviously very close to grandmaster shin i think we had again two very traditional grandmasters that were were amazing at what they did i think we're lucky in the uk because master can is very very similar he, he's he's got an ability to understand us all work with us all and and know what we're doing and, and have that interest and and uh again as a traditional martial artist i think we we lost Grandmaster Shin, obviously lost Grandmaster Baldwin, and we're lucky we got, um, well, the, the World Association is lucky we got Master Khan. I think, because again, as far as traditional martial arts goes, um, he's, for me, he's the next person who's got that humanitarian, that kind of traditional way of training, uh, keeps that old, old, old school training alive. Um, obviously, we've got Grandmaster Strong, he's a great Grandmaster, but I haven't had as much knowledge with Grandmaster Strong I haven't, I've only trained with him maybe once or twice in the European clinics. Fantastic martial artist. I know he is, and he's a great grandmaster. But uh, I think from the traditional side, I think for me, that's how it went after Grandmaster Baldwin. I think uh, Master Cam was my next kind of traditional martial artist that would keep us traditional, keep us, keep our traditions alive in what we do, you know, I think. And uh, we're very lucky to have him for that reason, you know. Absolutely. I, I agree 100%. Um... I just talking to all the different masters in the great in Great Britain and and hearing the the stories about him about how what an inspirational leader he is and talk about lead by example he's he's the guy who you know from, from you can see his technique is superb and just a top notch person so um, yeah and I think you say it right leading by example I mean, you can't, um, I don't think you can ever sort of, not that you've argued with Master Khan anyway, but you can't never say anything like that because he will always, he's always done everything. And like you say, well, if you, if you don't do it, then your students won't follow you. So he, and he sets the example for us, he'll do things that means we have to do it too. Um, and sometimes I haven't been able to do things over the years. And he said to me, look, you know, you, you've got to set this example. Um, and you could never turn around, and not that you would anyway, but you could never turn around and say, well, you know, you don't do a master camp, but that, you know, because obviously he's the type of person you lead from the front. And if we're all like him, we follow the traditional way he trains and, and what's expected of us, um, 
you know, we'd all get where we need to go and, and what we need to get get out of our tanks and over really. Right. I, I think just by just looking at the the exceptional masters that come out of uh, Great Britain Tung Sudo, yeah. um, you know, the 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 proof is in the pudding. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you know. We have got some very really uh, exceptional masters, I think, in in the UK. Uh, we've got a lot of young ones as well, a lot of younger masters as well, which are, are phenomenal uh, technicians. Um, so yeah, I think we are, we are very lucky. Um, but again, it all comes you know leading from the front, doesn't it? You know, they are very good master eyes. So you talked about having your own studio started at seventeen. Are you still in? Is that is this still the same studio or? Yeah, uh, well, it was um, up until recently. I've, I've moved recently, but yeah, it was my studio for literally 30 years. <laughs> wow. uh, and with the pandemic and things, um, things changed. We couldn't get back in the hall and things like that. So, yeah, 30 years I trained. Well, I would say almost 40 years. I was training there first as a student. And then uh, I took over the hall like, and I was actually teaching there for like 30 years. Yeah. So it was. Uh, you know, when you have a place like that, it's not mine. It was a hall that I hired. In fact, I've been hiring it for 30 years in the same hall. It just had a, it's got that amazing energy, your blood, sweat and tears in that hall. And, uh, you know, we've done everything there, <laughs> you know. Yeah. So, yeah, so, uh, it's amazing. And it's a shame to leave it, but, um, you know, it's one of those things changed, don't they? Yeah, yeah absolutely. Have you had the, any students that have gotten close to the to master's rank as far as uh, in, in the 30 years? No, I mean, I've got, I've had many sort of uh, third down, second down, but I've had my own, oh, I said I've had my own master. I have got masters under me, like I've got uh, Master Paddock, Stephen Paddock, he's, um, but he, I guess he didn't start as my student. He became my student, uh, obviously, when uh, uh, Master Zan Pirelli years ago, he's part of Bristol, he left. And then obviously I kind of inherited quite a few masters from the UK, but I think the way we look at sometimes when we get to master's rank and things like that, we, you know, we become master can student. Sure. Uh, but um, yeah, as, as in getting someone there, I think I've, I've many get to a third down, but I suppose right from white belt up, I don't think I've, I've recruited a master, but that shows that, you know, it takes, it's hard work to get someone to that level, but hopefully, you know, I've still got a lot of time left in me. I'll, um, I'll, I'll recruit some yet. Yeah. yeah you, you think of, like you said, 40, 40 years as a martial artist, you see so many people come and go. Uh, it's, yeah. it's, some people don't understand how uh, much dedication it takes because yeah. you got to train on your own. And then when you teach, you teach at night, you know, so the evening, evening times are, are tough. Uh, so it's, it's, a, it's a lot of dedication into something. Yeah. Um, Especially if you also have a full-time job. <laughs> yeah, your full-time jobs, you're doing that. But I guess if you love it and it is what you love doing, um, like I said, I get up and it's like breathing. It's like taking my first time. Tank has just been my life since such a young age. So, um, but yeah, I mean, it is, you think for 40, well, 40 years or 30, 30 odd years of teaching, 40 odd years of training, it's uh, what else would you do in your life? For that amount of time, and most of what you hold a job for that long, right. you know, <clears throat> um, there's been times, of course, there's been times where I've thought of giving up and thinking, you know, do I want to do something else? And I think the longest I ever, and I didn't officially give up, I kind of took a step back, but lasted me about a week, <laughs> and I realised I couldn't live without it, and I and I I just got back into it. You know, there's times, as I said, I think it's all times where you have family, you have a young family, I had young children years ago, and things like that. And times are hard, you know, I look at your family, do your class, you think, well, should I spend more time with my family? You know, and things like that. But, you know, my, all my, my kids trained in tanks today, they don't anymore, unfortunately, but um, my, my eldest got his black belt, my middle one got his chill and bow, my young girl, she got a red belt. And um, so when your family starts training, um, you know, it makes it easier. You know, look at Master Cam with all his family, daughters and, all ma you know, nearly all masters now, you know, as well. So it's, uh, if you're lucky enough to have your family train with you, it gets easier, but it's a hell of a lot of dedication, but you don't think about it, you know? Um, and unfortunately, sometimes, well, not unfortunately, I, I think I put tanks there before everything sometimes. I've even, my own jobs, I haven't taken jobs because they don't fit in with my class, what I teach. 
Right. I've had some very well paid jobs over the year, and I've decided no, I want to. I don't want to lose what I've got. And uh, maybe that's not the smartest thing <laughs> in the world as far as how you live and and, and making making your life your money because obviously tanks was a hobby. But um, yeah, I think it. Tanks have got me many jobs also by my discipline and things like that, you know. Um, but yeah, I, I always put tanks there first, even when, even looking for jobs. And sometimes I think we also always put it before our family sometimes, not in a hor- horrible way, but we have that commitment. And it's, you know, been doing it for 40 years. What else am I going to do? Huh? Yeah. <laughs> I, I totally understand that, though. My wife um, is also a master and... As soon as the, you name it, the black belt camps, master's clinic, the tournaments, you get, you get all those, you got to make sure all those days are, are off. <laughs> um, yeah, you your diary, yeah. <laughs> so I, I know outside of Tong Sudo, you, you also boxed uh, for a long time. Can you yeah. talk about your, your boxing and kickboxing uh, journey? Yeah, I mean, when I was, I think when I was about 18, uh, I, I was actually offered to be, to, to take up boxing professionally. Um, again, another, another time that I chose Tang Chido over, over a career, maybe what I would have had in boxing when I was, when I was 18. Um, I think I was 17, actually, just turned 18. So I was just training for my, my first stand at the gym. It was a boxing gym. And um, I used to box all the boxers down there and things like that. Then I got offered to go professional. But again, I couldn't teach, I couldn't train my tanks though and take up boxing. It was just, it was one or the other. Um, and by that time I'd been training 10 years in tanks though. And I obviously, again, another thing why I chose tanks though. But yeah, I boxed for a long time. I, I, at a young age, I, I kind of won a lot, of, a lot of fights and things. Um, but it was only ever sort of a, you know, sort of small competitions or, or white collar boxing and that sort of thing. And uh, then recently, I know, about like three, four years ago now, I decided to uh, get back into it. Just again, because I was training hard. And again, when you're teaching and you're training hard and you're fit and you're strong, you still fully got something left. You want to just compete against a few people and just, just do so. I did a few charity fights, raised some money for some local charities and stuff. Um, but unfortunately, you know, most of my recent fights, I always have a good fight, but they were against, you know, 20, 20 year old guys who were professional turning professional I was like the journeyman coming in just giving them a fight and I didn't I didn't really win many <laughs> uh, but I gave a good fight you know but again I said earlier when you're older you get hit on the chin it's completely different your knees start to wobble and you realize that you know you can't quite take the punch like you used to but um but I think it's like anything I you've got to put yourself out there how can you explain to any student about fighting about how to how to get through these adversities if you are hit, if you haven't done it yourself. Now, pretty not everybody's going to do that. Not everybody's going to want to get punched in the face two hundred times a night. But um, I did the same. I worked on the door for two or three years when you know again in my early twenties, and I did that purely because I not because I wanted to test my tanks today, but I want to test my yeah. I've I've learned a lot, and I want to help by that way. I could help other people. Well, equally, when we do self-defense, I've got some real things to pull on, some real real kind of experiences to pull on where, you know, I've taken on people with knives and where people actually tried to stab me. I've, mm-hmm. I've had some real experiences. And I think if you've got that, you can teach your, my favorite thing for teaching is self-defense, street self-defense, things like that. That's why I did it at a lot of the clinics. But I can draw on real experience, not the technique that maybe you've written in the book or you've adapted a tank stove technique. I've actually been there for real and done it. Um, I haven't been in loads of scrapes. I'm not. I'm not. I've been in a crazy. I had a crazy life, but I put myself as a doorman for a while. And I'm not the big. I'm five foot six, <laughs> so I was very much on the inside rather than I wasn't the big guys on the front. But I was the one. You know, get the hassle inside the, the place. You know, and uh, I put myself there just for that reason. Um, and again, as a young family started, I decided to to stop that because the risk was getting greater. A friend of mine was stabbed. Um, a shift before I did and things like that. And that was when I decided, you know, for 150 pound a night or whatever it was I was getting paid, it wasn't worth taking a knife. Um, and cause I had a young family and mm-hmm. things like that started. So yeah, no, I, I just stopped. I 
stopped it then. But again, I'm, I'm grateful for it because I've got a lot of real experiences from full contact fighting, where it's kickboxing, boxing, working on the doors, things like that, which is able to put into my tanks of those training. So I can teach traditional, but it's also one of my main things when you're teaching a class is I don't want to just teach a fitness class. I don't want people just to come and drill up and down and get fit. Um, my, if I feel I have a responsibility, those who come to class, that if something happens to them or they need to help their family, defend their family, defend themselves, I want to be able to give them something that really would work for them. And I think that I have a responsibility for that. And that's when my classes sometimes are slightly different. I keep the traditional, we do everything for our gut testings. But when it comes to real stuff, we don't stand in a front stance. You don't stand in a, in a way you've got to know how to read someone and things like that. So that's a real important thing for me. I think if I, if I taught anybody once, if they leave the dojo and they've learned something that could save their life or, or, or defend their family one time, that's, that's my goal really. The, the belts and the competitions and all that, that's amazing. That's a real thing for people to go for, but uh, ultimately it's a self-defense, you know, and, that, and that's a real passion of mine, you know? Okay. Yeah. I've, again, it's another thing that has been lost in, in 2020 is yeah. that contact and just grabbing someone and, and, and feeling the, you know, someone actually grabbing you and not wanting to let go. Uh, so I, I, yearn for the day that 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 can come back yeah definitely <laughs> <That me too. laughs> yeah um you mentioned gut testing uh master Khan asked as as bridger as bristol regional instructor how did you feel that you were able to squeeze the gut testing in for the area students the last wednesday before the lockdown how did that come about oh uh, well we again we were rigid, rigid scheduled for the saturday and um obviously we suddenly went into lockdown and uh, I was speaking to Master Khan on the phone and said, well, we're going to have to go the Zoom route um, and arrange that. And it was Master Khan actually turned around and said, um, you know, can you can you get a hall on, on the Wednesday? Is your hall available? Because it was it's in my dojo where we, where we do the testing. And um, obviously I said, I'll, I'll find out. And, uh, you know, Master Khan's got a driver, said three hours to come down, but he was he said, look, if you can get a hall on, I think he was excited to do a live testing too. You know, we didn't want to go to Zoom, you know. And uh, long story short, yeah, we, we had the availability. So, um, but then from then I had to, we had to go down the COVID route. So I had to put everything in place. Mm -hmm. I had done a floor plan of wherever they had to stand. We had to, I had to do a whole schedule of where people, what times people would come in, what times people would go out, going in one door, out the other door. People on doors taking temperatures and, and keeping everybody as safe as we could. Um, and literally within, I think, two nights, and I, and I was up till half past two in the morning, just literally on my laptop, trying to work out a floor plan, make sure we had timings right and, and everybody was as safe as we could make it. Um, and we had a fantastic, I think for me, it was one of our best gut testings we've had. And it seems like in a long while, not just because of Zoom, the standard was superb. Uh, Master Khan came down and his energy was phenomenal. He was really with the ch kids. He, he had them talking, he had them laughing. He was able to really keep them relaxed and things. And he seemed very excited to, to be there. And we have five, uh, four of other masters from, from Bristol in, in my region came to, to be on the panel. Um, and, you know, as I, again, while Master Khan's listening, we, we, we owe him a big thank you for coming down uh, in, you know, for, three hour drive just to take a, a two hour gut testing just to allow us to um to put on this testing and i had a lot of thanks after actually a lot of students came back to me messaged me and said thank you so much we were able to do a live testing i don't think anybody was looking forward to going lockdown nobody was looking forward to doing a testing in their living room because it's difficult um and they're really really appreciative of me for the work that i put in appreciative uh you know work the mass camp putting to come up to come to to us and obviously we had a, I had a team that was helping me on the day again it just shows that we have a good good region a good good lot a good team around us that we we're able in in two days really to pull something off in a safe manner with covid um and and it it was brilliant and we had a fantastic night and i think everybody get away we just buzz at the end of the night it was it's fantastic and lots of messages come through uh, of appreciation from parents saying, you know, 
little Jimmy loved it. You know, it was great. He really, again, someone I've never seen Master Cam before. You know, it's been locked down for so long. We had we had a lot of orange spots, you know, sort of between 10th and 8th Cup. We had a probably about 20 or 30 of those. And they were able to see Master Cam for the first time as well. And that meant a lot to them. And he was very personal with them as well. So I think um, that meant a lot to him. And, you know, and it certainly meant a lot to us as a region. I think it, you know, gave everybody a, a sense of, you know, if we want to do something, we can, you know. Absolutely. And, and just being able to be in the presence of other instructors and, and black belts masters when you're used to doing it all the time yeah. and then it's taken from you just to have those couple hours. It's, it really Yeah. 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 I mean, obviously, we were looking originally on the Saturday, we were going to get uh, our first live session with Master Khan doing a seminar after or a short class. But obviously, he came down so late on a Wednesday evening, so we couldn't do a class. Uh, so a lot of us as instructors and masters in, in my region here, we were really looking forward to having a little training session with Master Khan. But, uh, you know, by the time we finished, it was nine o'clock in the evening. He had a three hour drive. I think he got home at midnight. Um, you know, so obviously, we we're going to do a training session. Um, but yeah, we're all looking forward to like it's just said, just looking forward to getting together and you know. But like I said, I'm, I'm really impressed that we were able to come together as a team and you know show what we can do in the UK. You know, oh, well, in Bristol, you know, I said in the UK. Well, uh, right. Master Khan says you, you did a you did a great job. So oh, fantastic. <laughs> um, you talked about some of the things that you you found in looking you know looking at memories we're we're actually believe it or not uh getting close to an hour mark did you have some some things that you would like to to share with the group or share with us as far as any of the the relics of your your martial arts training oh well that's probably too too many to mention but um oh, we were talking about earlier when we said um with uh master goblin uh, yeah. Say, yeah we're uh, a european clinic in Wells uh, over here and um, we were in a, a university and uh, with session of fear so we I said we, we take him out and just go and grab a, a quick beer or something or uh, I'll walk into the university or quick drink and we happened to walk into a private party uh, which with a load of big rugby players and um, as we walked in they'd all had a drink of things and before I knew it we had kind of had a a circle <laughs> developing around us. And that was me, I think it was Master Wooten um, and uh, Master Godwin. And I'm thinking, we've got our guest, Master Godwin here, and we're gonna end up in a brawl here. I thought, I was, one of us, I was glad he was there. <laughs> so, um, you know, but obviously we managed to talk ourselves down and walk away. I thought I was gonna get the Master Disaster Award that year, just for, <laughs> just for almost drawing him into a bar fight. But, um, we tend to, we managed to walk away and talk ourselves down. And we, we've been in there previously. We just didn't realize it was a private party. And, um, but yeah, that was a, a pretty sort of scary time. And uh, like I said, I, did, I got away. I think Master Whiskin got the Master's Disaster Award that year for some kind of pole dancing, but you can talk to him about that. I think he was doing uh, something. I, I should have talked to you before I did his interview. Yeah. I, miss, I, I missed that. I'll have to. Yeah. I have to touch base with him on now. I'm pretty sure it was that year he got he got it first doing some kind of pole dancing or something. So uh, oh, that's brilliant. <laughs> well, I think over the years, I mean, I, I I couldn't go through so many stories, but uh, we've had you know it's been a great great lifetime achievement just being part of the the association. You know, I've met so many people over the years. Speak to people in the UK all the time now uh, over the US on on Facebook and things like that. Just got friends, you know. You think you can go anywhere in the world, and, and you've got friends with this, with, you know, with this logo on, you know. And we can um, just just met some people, got some experiences to uh, to to take with me and be able to share. And hopefully, my students will have the same in years to come, you know. Yeah. Well, sir, I, I want to thank you for joining me. I, I really appreciate it. I uh, feel very honored to have the opportunity to speak with you for an hour. Um, is there anything you want to share with us uh, as we wrap up? Well, say? no. First off, I want to uh, appreciate you inviting me for, for an interview. It's, it's a real pleasure to do that. Um, just like I say, so again, just while we're on there, just sort of thank you for, you know, to Master Cam for his guidance for us all in the UK and kept us going. Um, you know, thank you to all, you know, my students, 
first and foremost, you know, I want to thank them because they've given me so much. I think as instructors, we're nothing without our students. And they, I know a lot of them have been listening this afternoon and their commitment has been amazing through lockdown and, and since we've been training a little bit in the dojo before. Um, you know, this, this is unprecedented times at the moment. None of us really know what to do with this COVID. Um, but, you know, we're keeping everybody safe. And I think just, I'd like to say thank you to everybody who's given me that commitment, given me an opportunity because without them, I can't do what I love doing and I love teaching. Um, and I think it's a, you know, I just like one thing, you know, let's all stay safe. Um, hopefully it looks like we may have a vaccine at some point uh, coming out and we may be able to move on in life. But um, I think just, Everybody just stay safe, stay, stay well. And uh, again, so the people who train with me, I've got some good friends out. Mr. Crook, you've seen was on there, Ian Crook, great friend of mine, has always been there as a friend. Mr. Jarvis, always on the end of the phone for me when, when I've got a problem and I've got others I can mention too. Um, but yeah, I think in tanks that we don't, we've got some great friends, not students, uh, they're great friends as well. Um, a great friend within Master Khan, I know we can pick up the phone at any time. So. Um, as I said, just say, stay safe. Thank you for everybody's commitment, which allowed me to do what I, I enjoy doing most. Um, and that's may it continue. And uh, hopefully, we'll get a chance to meet soon. Master Watson and we'll train together when we get over to the US. Yeah, US. And I, I've, I've talked to quite a few. I, you know, I, I, I need to get over to, to Europe for the master's clinic and, and uh, Black Yeah, it's great to see you. Um, yeah, it's definitely definitely on my list. Uh, my like I said, my wife and I are, are both masters. Uh, we have two daughters to train, and and uh, definitely want to get over and you know sh share with share with that brotherhood, and you know see the see what what you guys talk about. Well, I really think you guys are a big family uh, over there uh, in, in Great Britain. So. Well, we're all, you know, that's the nice thing about the World Association. Wherever we go, we all feel welcome. We all feel like we're a big family. Uh, we have got a very close knit in the UK. Um, but again, as a World Association, I think we always have, you know, you can go anywhere and you're invited in and, and you always looked after. Like, just can't wait for us all to get back together again and do these clinics and start enjoying our training again properly. I agree. Well, thanks again, sir. I appreciate it. And uh, like you said, I ho hopefully we will uh, we'll see each other sooner than later. Yeah. No, thank you very much. All right. Tongsu, sir. Uh, Tongsu.